Okay, good morning. Uh, so I think today and Wednesday, on, on Friday, there will be a substantial fast forward because I want to reach uh, some place which will overlap in some small sense, at least with what Jacob will do in his, in his, in his module. So there's one debt that I didn't get to put on the board for functions of several variables, and this is the analog of uh, the theorem from one, one variable for global functions. If f from kn to k is definable, so this is global, similar. it's not partial now, it's the whole universe is kn and k differentiable, then f is polynomial in several variables. So there are no global functions, analytic global functions other than uh, polynomials. And actually, I'm going to do two proofs. And until uh, two weeks ago, this is the only proof that more or less uh, this I, I gave several times. And this is the obvious thing. We have by compactness now that if you have a function of several variables, which is polynomial in each variable, then there is a bound on that. So uh, first of all, for every a one to a n minus one in k to the n minus one, f of a z in the last variable is polynomial by the one variable result. And therefore, as we noted by logic, there is a bound. There is an n such that uh, each such that the degree of f a z is less than or equal to n. So we can write f of uh, x y as the sum k goes from zero to n of a k x y to the k. And now just by taking derivative in the last coordinate and using induction, we can show that these have to be uh, polynomials as well. So looking at, so which we know the differentiable functions are, have differentiable derivatives. So looking at the f dy of f, sorry, the f dy, we can finish by induction. by induction. And I always thought this was a very nice use of compactness and why it's useful to work in an arbitrary structure, blah, blah, blah. But then just two weeks ago, I learned of a paper by Pale from 1978, quite short paper which gives a much stronger result with nothing, with no assumption. So here is the statement. Let K be any field. I don't think there is any characteristic assumption. S from, well, he does it from K square, but the same proof, you just do inductive argument work. Any function, right? It's nothing, no algebra in the assumptions, but such that, F is separately polynomial in each single variable. So you, whenever you fix the coordinates, n minus one coordinates, then it's polynomial in the last coordinate, such that F is polynomial in each variable separately. Okay, that's it, almost, almost, but now you have to assume that k is uncountable. If k is uncountable, then it's polynomial. If it's not, he has counterexamples that it's not. But that's it, nothing else. If k uncountable, then f is in k. And this is necessary condition. Amazing, I thought. And it's a quite elementary proof, very nice, some algebra. I didn't read all the details, but it surprised me greatly that this is true. And in fact, 
There is some variant of that, but hmm, that I got somehow, but it didn't appear yet on the archive of Kurdika and co author, which show something not exactly like that for Nash, for Nash set. That if a subset of uh, C to the N is Nash on every hyperplane, uh, then it is Nash, something like that. And also they have, and this is true in any real closed field. Actually. I remember one seeing this a bit before, uh -huh. but I, I, I mean, I think I forgot about it. <laughs> right. It's good to be reminded. It's, co it's called uh, uh, an algebraic version of Hartog's theorem, something like that. It has the word title Hartog in, his, in the title. The only reason I learned of it is because of the paper in Kur of Kurdika. And uh, sorry, I forgot the quarter where they mentioned that. But uh, yeah, I, I thought it was amazing. That it's, really, it's, it's really worth looking at. It. There is some nice algebraic argument. And not only that, it's very nicely written. So if you read the first three pages, it just explains the difficulties. It gives a proof over C using Hartog theorem, in which you actually use a little bit of bare category theorem and stuff like that over C. But then he says, this is just red herring. I didn't need it at all. We could have done everything just in arbitrary uncountable C. So he has even uh, uh, analytic proof over C, but, uh, but then he says it was unneeded. I just cheated you, yeah. When you say it's polynomial in each variable, it means that for any value of yeah, for any value in n minus one coordinate in each one of the what he called the now he does it for k square only, but uh, I'm sure it works because then he does it for algebraic varieties in general, so you can do injections. So he says, uh, yeah, yeah, it's really very nice argument. I mean, it's really I, 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 it's not that I know the argument, but I very briefly that because he's is so nicely presenting this result. The, the argument itself is like three pages, two pages, maybe. I don't know, very short. Do, do you remember the journal? No, or? no, but it, I can find it later. I have it on my iPad, so we can, I can show it to you. All right. Now, um, I want to talk about definable. Okay, now I'll say something. Manifolds and analytic sets. All right, now, because I'm reaching the part of the talk of the module where I'm going to hopefully, as I said, overlap with what uh, Zimmerman will be doing. And I understand that for certain people, it's hard to get around this issue of K, this abstract setting of K and R and real closed fields and Owen structures. So from now on, I will just work over C. But all the definitions and all the theorems are true in this abstract setting of an ominimal expansion of a real closed field, Lipschitz Robinson setting, whatever you want. But just to simplify and to make it explicit, I will just write C all the time. But if you are not uh, intimidated, you, you can put K if you want. All right. So what I mean by definable now C manifold or complex manifold is uh, well first of all a definable set which we don't care at all some set m sitting in power of r to the n it can sit uh, divided to many pieces just a set with no structure two a finite cover Of sets by definable subsets, still nothing, just cover just means a union, nothing so far. I in I. And now we want to say that this is an atlas. So for each and for each I in I, we have a definable bijection. I, I'll do it from UI into, but now it's important in KN, this is fixed. This is the, will be the dimension. And now this is open. It means CN. CN, yes, yes, yes. I will probably it will repeat several times. I apologize. I wrote it all with K and I decided the last moment to change. 
such that, okay, now these are open, so this puts the manifold structure on it such that the transition maps are biholomorphic or it's enough in each direction holomorphic because they're invertible. Uh, the transition maps the IJ from the I of UI to section UJ into CJ of UI intersection UJ. And these are all now subsets, open subsets of CN are kaolomorphic, or you can say biolomorphic because they are invertible, are C holomorphic, sorry, are holomorphic, just holomorphic. And definable, I should say. I want this intersection. Well, they will be definable, I guess. So, because it's the restriction to a definable set. So M is a subset of CN. Or M is just just no, not N. It's not N. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's just anything. Yeah. I, I, I always find this kind of definition strange because uh, to me. When you talk about manifolds, you should not think of something as you should not think of it as given as a subset of some Cartesian power. That is sort of contrary to the the whole idea of them of manifold. But otherwise, we don't have a notion of a definable set. So. No, what you do is you say you have a set with a finite cover. Um, yeah, and you just and, and to together with these bijections on open subsets. Of definable open subsets of CN. Yeah, but then you the need to mod out by an equivalence relation. The transition maps are definable. Yeah, but then you need to mod out by an equivalence relation to realize it as a definable object. <laughs> and uh, I don't like that. We can talk about that later. The, all the, what you say. Okay, all right. This will work, but this is much more complicated because now you have to say when you consider two such things as the same thing. Well, Anyway, no, I, I'm fine with that. I know what you mean, but I, I don't want to divide an equivalent relation. I just want I to have a have set somewhere, a set sitting somewhere in the world on which everything lives, which is the same. It's equivalent to the definition you're I giving. I don't have to Okay. All right. I don't have to divide by equivalent relation. How do you realize it as a definable object? You, de you simply introduce what you mean by a definable subset of if your... it's on every chart definable yes you can do that and then you show that it, this doesn't depend on which chart you take all right anyway um... okay so yeah i agree that there are several different ways to do it i prefer that just because i have a definable set somewhere in the world that i can talk about and then to be definable map uh, makes sense because you have a definable set so it makes sense to have a definable map but i agree that it's all the same all right, so the examples are, of course, any definable open uh, set in C to the N. And then you have just one chart. There's nothing to do. Uh, and uh, uh, if F from U C N to C is definable and uh, holomorphic then its graph is a definable manifold with one chart with, uh, now important example is projective space And this is with the usual n plus one chart, each of them uh, uh, c to the n identified with c to the n. Uh, the usual uh, n plus one affine charts. Right, and you can use, for example, the fact that we have uh, some definable embedding of p n c into r to the k. To realize it as a definable set. 
Now, a, a very important, important family of examples is the following. I'll start with a very simple example. C over lambda, where lambda is a discrete subgroup. Now, I'm not saying that you can, I think you can always do it, but I'll give a concrete example. Subgroup of C plus. And the simplest example is lambda, let's say I'll write, I'll, I'll normalize by two pi i z, but just two, uh, i z will be fine, will be good. And now we have to be slightly careful because of course the map, we, the map that goes from C to C lambda, whatever C lambda lives, nothing like this cannot, cannot be definable. Even if we make, well, it doesn't make sense yet even. So there are several ways now to view this as a definable object, but the most, uh, uh, the simplest way will be to take the fundamental set So we will take as our universe now, the set, uh, uh, let's call this M will be the set of all Z such that the imaginary part is between two pi. And now the chart that I could give could be just one chart will be the, Right, we'll have u1 to be m z greater than zero, less than two pi. And for the second chart, I just have to cover to do the gluing. There are ways, to, several ways of doing it, but we can just let's say cut here in the middle. And the second chart, I hope I'm having it right, is m z greater or equal to zero less than pi, let's say union, the upper part, so it will be in Z greater than pi, less than two pi. And with that transition maps having to do the gluing, so you will probably be, uh, what is it, subtracting. Uh, yeah, so you have to identify and you want to glue all of this basically to identify back with this script. So with the proper gluing, which is just a subtracting in one direction. I forget if it is by two pi or by pi, but with the obvious gluing. So this already makes the quotient. So now you realize, so we have a, a manifold, which is as a, as a complex manifold will be isomorphic to C mod lambda, more than that, it has even a group structure, a definable group structure, because to add things here, you just have to go up and go back. If you get out, when you add things, two things in here, if you go out, you subtract two pi in the, in the Y coordinate. And if you remain, you stay the same. So you can put the group structure as well on this manifold. So this manifold become a definable topolo a, a holomorphic group, definable complex group, which is isomorphic as a complex object to this group. This is a complex, a complex Lie group. So we will get here on M a definable even group structure, making it isomorphic, not definably. Okay, but what I want to say is note there is no definable. Uh, how should I say, you know, it's not even uniformization, no covering map. Covering map, there is an abstract covering map, but it cannot be definable to M because then the kernel we have to be discrete and infinite, and this is impossible. Right, because of infinite discrete kernel. And this will happen a lot in all the examples. 
examples. Okay, now having said that, we know that there is a way to realize C mod lambda as an algebraic object as well, not just a semi algebraic. Notice that this is just semi algebraic, it's actually semi linear. It's a semi linear object right now. Right? We didn't need anything. The, the translation map is plus minus. These are semi linear. So it's all definable. All the data is definable semi linearly. But there is a way, of course, to realize C mod lambda as, a, as an algebraic object. Right? So we also have C mod lambda just isomorphic as an algebraic object to C star. Why? Because we have X going from C to C star with the kernel being 2 pi Z. Kernel of X equal to 2 pi I Z. So one can ask, can you realize, is there a definable isomorphism in the category of complex objects? between the M that we defined here and C star. And the answer is that there is, but it depends on which structure you work in. But if you are willing to put the exponential function restricted to a strip, which we know we can define in RNX, then in RNX, we will get even an embedding of M into the algebraic world with the group structure. I guess you only need Rn with restricted uh, sign or something. Right, right. But Rx with restricted sign. You need Rx with restricted sign and cosine. Right, that's all. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. If okay. R, R is the O minimum structure, has e to the x sign restricted to some interval, doesn't matter which one, because we can get it everywhere. Let's put pi just to, say, to be safe. Then X restricted to the fundamental set. Well, I should just call it M. Maybe I should call it because it's also a fundamental set. So let's use F here for fundamental sets. We're going to have more. Restricted to F into from F to C star is actually a bijection. The image of plus is times, and then we realize so holomorphic, of course. So we get it induces, I don't know, you can call it some X uh, induces. Uh, biholomorphism of the groups, the semi-linear group all right so notice this uh, difference on the level of what you want just to realize it as a complex manifold then you don't need much. You just need the semi-linear setting. Uh, well, does not, has no doesn't make sense because the transition maps in order to to anyway you need semi-algebraic in order to talk about holomorphicity. But uh, if you want to realize it in an algebraic object, you need more. You need to add more structure, and this happens a lot in all the uh, applications. Okay, now similarly, another variant of that, B lambda is a lattice, first in R2, but you can do the same thing in Rn, in R2. So it means that lambda is generated by uh, Z tau one plus Z tau two, where tau one, tau two are independent. And then C mod lambda, first of all, is again 
a group because lambda is a subgroup, it's an abelian group, and is a compact, is a compact complex Lie group. And again, we don't have hope to have the whole object with the lattice definable in an ominable structure, but we know that we can pick a fundamental set if we let F be, I'll just draw the picture, fundamental parallelogram. Then now by covering F with four charts, it's easy to see or maybe two even, so you take the inside, then you put maybe two or three charts is enough. One chart, the middle point, another chart, the same thing we did there in this direction and then in this direction and can endow it semi-linearly actually, can endow F with a definable complex structure. Making it actually a definable complex uh, uh, complex group, compact, right? So this is a definable complex compact compact group, and this can be done semi-linearly. But as we know, each one of these has also an algebraic manifestation because each one of these is isomorphic to an elliptic curve. Okay, so I'll avoid writing down here. Now, as, so this is an analogy to here. Uh, in addition, C mod lambda is isomorphic, one can call it E tau, an elliptic curve. Right, so, so these are projective complex groups, which whose universe is algebraic and the group operation is algebraic. And the map here is the Weierstrass P function. P function. And again, we cannot hope to have such a function definable just in a semi-linear, in semi-linear, in semi-algebraic or semi-linear. These are transcendental maps, but because the domain is basically the a compact set, or we can take the domain to be a compact, just the closure of the fundamental parallelogram, and uh, these functions are well defined outside of it. Then now, in R sub n. Uh, turn well, this is immediate in R sub n, the function P from uh, restricted to F, let's call it F tau to F tau from F to E tau is definable. So uh, we have uh, what is defined. Let's call this uh, F. No, this is let's call it M tau here. The manifold structure. Let's call it M tau. In contrast to the set, so M tau is definably isomorphic to an elliptic curve in R sub n. So the algebraic manifestation of that requires going to R sub n, but we have a semi-linear even uh, way to describe what it is as an object. In the category, so in the category of holomorphic maps, we have it already. It's isomorphic to R to C mod lambda, but in the category of definable maps, we need to add, if we want to identify with an algebraic object, we need to add more structure. 
Okay, now the question is already interesting. What happens when you vary tau? Can you definably uh, capture uh, the family of this Weierstrass p function? And uh, Sergey and I have results about saying, talking about uh, uniform definability of phi, p tau, but with in RNX. I will not uh, discuss it here. Let me uh, just end this list of example, which is easy to see that in the structure R sub n, every compact complex manifold has biomorphic or an isomorphic in this category an isomorphic definable R sub n definable manifold. Why? Because you can you can cover the manifold by fine. You have to be careful, and we did it in some in one of the papers. Just but it's quite uh, easy to see. You cover it by finitely many open sets. You shrink a little bit, and then you just use the fact. That uh, uh, definable, that real analytic functions are definable on proper sets, on proper boxes, and you can cover because it's compact. You can cover it by finitely many nice functions, such that all the transition maps and everything will be definable in R sub n. All right, but uh, again, it doesn't mean that every, uh, not even every. So this is interesting. So. Here we have example, I should say, maybe. We have example of a this definable complex manifold. We have an example, I didn't say it, but in a second we'll say that the elliptic curve just in the algebraic language can be realized as a definable complex manifold. So we have two definable complex manifolds, which are isomorphic as, as complex manifolds, even compact. But the isomorphism needs R sub n. To real to be realized it's not just true it's not true that in every structure in which they we had it before i guess with uh, c star uh, it doesn't mean that in any structure that the two live they actually have already a definable isomorphism between them even though they have abstract isomorphism between them. all right abstract you mean a complex analytic yeah a complex analytic that manifold mean that you have an rn definable isomorphism uh, right that's yeah. right yeah the fact that they have a complex that they're isomorphic as complex analytic objects doesn't mean even though each one of them is definable doesn't mean right. that you have an isomorphism which is defined okay let's talk about functions So if M and R definable manifolds, uh, well, F from N to N is uh, well, actually, I don't know. Now, now that I have it in this way, there's nothing much to say. A definable holom k holomorphic function between them is just a definable function between the two sets. The sets are definable. So maybe I'll write it. Uh, a definable holomorphic. Everything over C, but again, you can just put K everywhere. Uh, function. F from n to n is first of all a definable function between the sets is a definable function on the sets. So I just remind you what it means to be holomorphic on manifolds such that when it's read through the charts, it's holomorphic. So that reading via the charts. On each chart, now it becomes a map from an open subset of Cn to an open subset of Ck. Is defined. A is a holomorphic.
Okay. Let's talk about sub manifold. Ah, oh, I shouldn't have written here. Okay. I hope I get this right. Uh, Okay, I'll write it first like this. Uh, definable submanifold. Well, actually, there's nothing I think much to say now in this language. Uh, it was all I wrote it for the K language for which it made sense because I was introducing notions, but uh, uh, okay, I'll just write it subset of uh, definable C manifold. M is a definable set such that in every chart it's an R submanifold. So there are probably several ways to do it, such that, uh, first of all, such that X is an R submanifold. Right, so this is an R. If it's a C manifold, it's an R manifold. You can look at the chart to see that it's smooth everywhere. And the tangent space at each A in X in charts has a, is K, K linear, is C linear, is C linear so it's all linear for sure the tangent space as, as a subset of and this is invariant this is independent of the choice of charts because all this, this all the charts are biholomorphism all the transition maps are biholomorphism so uh, and again let's the examples are, first of all, any open subset, any definable open subset of M of the complex manifold is again a submanifold, is a submanifold. Less trivial. No, actually, no, this is immediate also. This is immediate as a submanifold. Any non singular algebraic, complex algebraic variety, complex algebraic variety, either in CN or in PNC. As a tangent space, which is C linear, it's clear. And here, if you're not used to it, it's worth noting that in CN, the only compact submanifold are finite. Right? So this is a fact which distinguishes uh, Euclidean real space from Euclidean complex space. So we note the only compact complex submanifold of CN of finite. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Yeah, the word is missing here. Right? A definable subset of is called is a submanifold, a complex submanifold. Thank you. C submanifold. If yeah, 
and now it was not it's not proper grammar a definable subset of a c manifold m is a complex of manifold if it is a definable set x thing and now there is a small theorem that needs to be proven and i think in the in the paper of uh, in the book sorry on real algebraic geometry of both not cost and war there is a similar theorem for in the real analytic in the real algebraic setting but uh, if m is a definable c manifold and x in m is a definable sub manifold is a the manifold then itself it is a, a definable manifold which remember the main thing is that we can cover it by a finite atlas so itself it can be realized as a definable manifold because you can cover it by taking generic projection in the right direction then it admits the structure of a definable C manifold, which mainly means finitely many charts. And I think this finitely many charts will play a very important role in what uh, this finiteness plays a crucial role, I think, in all the, uh, in what uh, Jacob will be talking about. This will even, I think, if you forget to say that, it will appear again and again. This is, I think, it will appear as the notion called site or in the category, in the Schiff theoretic uh, uh, presentation of things. Okay, but first of all, this is a fact. So, in particular, if you take a non singular algebraic variety in CN or in PNC, it can be covered by finitely many charts, blah, 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 making it into a definable manifold. Okay, analytic sets. M a definable C manifold. Uh, and analytic I will not say complex analytic because for me it will always be so I I will forget say maybe complex analytic but now from now on all my analytic will be complex analytic okay so C analytic subset of M is a definable closed Right, it's not locally analytic, it's analytic, so it's closed. Uh, X in M such that for every Z in X, there is a neighborhood U depending on Z of Z definable. And finitely many functions. I'll write this explicitly. Finitely many functions f1 to fr from uz into c definable c holomorphic. It's an open set, so it has a meaning more generally it will be i don't need to it will be k differentiable such that x intersection u is exactly the zero set of f1 to f1 right the zero set 
use it. All right, so we are carving. So if the set is uh, in each point, we are realizing it as the zero set of uh, definable of finitely many definable analytic functions. Okay. Sorry, sorry, Kobe. Yes, yes. Uh, you in your definition, you you wrote uh, for every z in x. So you okay. don't take every z in m because it's closed. Ah, right. Okay. Z, okay. Okay. Z outside x, it's, you don't need anything, right? Okay. Right. Right. Thank you. It's empty. Can I ask something? Mm -hmm. uh, can you cover this uh, by finally many of those users? Yeah, yeah this is the theorem. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, no. Yes, so a priori notice that this is a non definable definition in the sense in parameters. If you have a family, remember we had something like that already when we talked about neuromorphicity. If you had a family of sets like that, to say that our neighborhood and the, this is a problem which is not first order. To say there are finitely many definable functions realizing as the zero set is a non definable property, supposedly in parameters, but it turns out that it is. So it turns out that indeed you can cover it by finitely many and finitely many such uh, yeah. families of functions cover X, and it becomes, because of that, a definable property. Right. All right. Are you going to prove that or? Uh, no, I will say maybe a word about this, but okay. I will not do much proof, I think. But uh, at some point I will say, I will talk about the ingredients for the main, all this, yeah, it's the similar family of results that I will try to say something about, hopefully we'll make it less mysterious. Uh, So again, examples. Oh. Now, of course, every analytic, every algebraic variety is given actually by one chart, by one uh, uh, set like this. So every algebraic variety in CN or PNC is an analytic set, a definable analytic set, of course. Every definable submanifold, well, is a locally analytic set, I should say. So, uh, okay, I will not. Uh, write this and but i'll write two if m is a realized already a compact a definable compact the manifold so i realized it in the structure r sub n let's say Then every analytic subset is also definable because it will be given because of compactness, it will be closed. So you will cover it by finitely many sets. So every analytic subset of M will be definable in R sub N. Every analytic subset of M is definable. And the theorem that, in some sense, we'll be talking around, there is a classical theorem of Chow. Say that in the context of projective space, which is a compact complex manifold, the two agree with each other, this one and two. So every analytic 
subset of projective space, if you want, is definable in the real field, but it's algebraic. It's an algebraic variety. Algebraic projective, of course. And this is in the yeah. 50s. I would say you talk about algebraic sub varieties of CN, but I would want to insist that they are closed, that is closed in CN, because you could also have, let's say, uh, a complement of a. Algebraic, sorry, algebraic sub variety, let's say. Is this okay? Uh, I mean, normally sub variety includes the possibility of, of let's say, um, the complement of an open, of a. Of a closed. Of a closed no, this is uh, not. This will not be considered sub variety. Well, no. It, this it will be a constructive in the normal terminology that would be considered a sub variety, but not a closed sub variety. Anyway, it's not. No, I, I, okay. So be, the terminology that I'm aware of, I think, what you mean, what you talk about is constructible set. Of course, for not every constructible set. No. Is, uh, well, anyway. All right. We seem to disagree on the terminology, but <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. that's fine. Yes. As but I agree. As, it's closed. As closed. long as we know what you're talking about. Right. Right. Now notice that this is a false, of course, but let's just remember that, that there is no affine version of that because there are many transcendental analytic functions. So let's just note as written, Charles theorem fails or CN, because for example, the graph of E to the Z, Z in C, C2, is easy to see everywhere. It is the zero set of the function uh, Y minus E to the Z is an analytic set, but of course not algebraic. But of course it's not definable. I mean, this is just abstract. The theorem, child theorem is an abstract theorem on no, no definability. At least a priori, although one can formulate that notice. Yeah, okay. We could say that every Rn definable analytic subset of PNC is in fact uh, definable algebraically. Right? A priori, it might be every analytic sub variety of because this is compact, is definable in R sub n. At the end, we can move from R sub n to an algebraic object. And here there are no definability assumptions. All right. And what I mostly want to talk about today and Friday, maybe Friday I will do more examples, is theorems on removal of singularity. Which, uh, in some sense, even the, the answer to Love's question about the definability of the notion of analytic, it also somehow comes out very related to theorems on removal of singularities. So, removal of singularities in, I will say exactly what I mean. But now, not for functions, but for varieties, for analytic varieties. So, what is the problem, the basic problem? Assume M is, uh, I will only look about definable, but the problem makes sense in general, is a definable complex manifold. No assumptions.
u in m a definable open set the open set could be obtained by removing a point could be obtained by taking a disk could be obtained by removing something else from m something closed but it's an open set and inside u we have a, an analytic subset of u right so now it's important very much when i say analytic subset analytic subset of an, of something and x in u is a definable let's say analytic subset of u right i will even if i will forget to say that which means it's a closed subset of u relative in the u topology in relative topology it's closed and analytic we want to ask when is it true that when we take the closure of u of x now inside m it remains analytic okay so when is the closure and i emphasize now in m still analytic but now analytic in m when it happens we say some we'll see in a second that we kind of remove singularities from uh, well from x or from i mean skipping basically so what we are doing we are notice that if x is definable its closure in m is also definable the m has a definable topology so the closure of x is again a definable set it has in it a piece the piece living in u which is analytic and the closure the question is did we add too much stuff to somehow destroy analysticity and of course this can happen often so here is here are a few examples let m be c u the open disk the open unit disk then u as a set inside u is analytic because it equals u everywhere it's just the zero set of the of of the function z right so let x equal to u every manifold is an analytic subset of itself uh, is analytic in u if we take its closure we'll get the closed disk and on the frontier we will not get analyticity but the closure of x is the closed disk and points here will not be locally the zero set of an analytic function because we know that if a zero set of analytic function has cluster points it has to be zero everywhere so on the frontier we will not be able to realize the closure as an analytic set so this is not an analytic not analytic in c because of this frontier and indeed the problem was i'll say notice that somehow we have big frontier to the set it's a legal frontier or minimally right it's not an all minimal problem it's a problem of the set because the set is has dimension one less than the dimension of x but its frontier we will see is too big so i'll just say it is a preliminary remark frontier is too big this is true that all proper uh, subsets of c bits are analytic must be finite uh, yes uh, all proper subsets of c which are analytic must be finite that's true except c ah uh, yeah but proper yes uh, yeah 
Yeah, this is true with no sampling. Because every function which will be, well, no, I mean, definable or not definable? I, yeah, I meant definable. Definable, yeah. yes, not Z. Z is an analytic subset of C, which is uh, uh, not finite, but definable will be because if it's infinite, there'll be a cluster point to the zero set of F. And then we know that it has to be uh, uh, globally zero, locally zero, but then globally zero. Uh, you can take a variant of that, by the way, but if you feel that this is some cheating, you can look at a variant of that. So just another variant of this, look at uh, uh, U equal to D cross D, let's say, inside C square. So the poly disk and let uh, X be the graph of uh, F where F of X equal to X square restricted to the unit disk. So it's a holomorphic function from X actually, well, the, the range is also inside so it's the graph of a holomorphic function on the whole of the of the, of the open disk. So X is analytic subset in this square. X is analytic in U. So in this square, but its closure is easy to see is not analytic because you will get problems on the boundary. But closure of X not. What, this has to be checked in C square. And again, the problem is that you have large frontier. This has dimension one, the graph, uh, sorry, dimension two is an O minimal object. It's the graph of a function on an open disk. It has dimension two, its frontier will have dimension one, and this will again be a problem. Okay, again, problem of large frontier and let's do one non-definable example just to remember that classically these problems appear all the time and again let's look at f from c minus zero to c which is f of z equal to e to one over z and now the graph of F sitting in C star for C. So, yeah, so this is a U is like C star for C. This is our U is open in C is analytic because it's an analytic function on in U. But when we take its closure, the problem of essential singularity above zero it's not hard to see but even though it's only one point now but again because of large frontier in c square is not analytic in c square because of the points above zero will all be bad points you cannot realize it locally as the graph of uh, as the zero set so again, the problem here is of large frontier. You can say also large frontier. Here, the frontier actually has dimension two. Remember, we said that because the whole the whole uh, zero cross C will be in the frontier. Okay. So let me put the classical removal singularity theorem, which is really not the strongest, the stronger classical, but this is nice to, to formulate. Classical theorem on removal of singularities. Actually, the, I think when we worked on all these problems, the book for that that we found most useful was the book of Chow on complex analysis, not of Chow, of Chirka on complex analytic, I put it in the bibliography, complex analytic sets. He has a variety because he himself, I think, worked on removal of singularity theorems. So he has a variety of uh, theorems. 
starting from what I'll put on the board, but more elaborated one. So classical theorem on removal of singularity. So removal of singularity will basically be a theorem that under certain assumptions, the closure is analytic. And this is called the Remert-Stein theorem. Let M be a complex manifold. No definability here. This is just classical result. E. Like there is no E yet in this statement. We will in a second we'll see a complex analytic set. And now we let U be the complement. So it's not an arbitrary set. Let U be X minus E. So E is closed in particular. So this is open. An analytic set for us is closed. Right, so we have, this is M, this is E. And now we look at the complement of E and we assume let X inside U, so inside X minus E, sorry, no, M, sorry, 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 there's no X, sorry, M minus E. And X is in M minus E. Okay, this is M. You remove an analytic set from, uh, from M. And now let X be, okay, now we need some assumption. First of all, an irreducible. I didn't say what it is, I'll say in a second. Analytic subset of M minus E, remember it's closed inside M minus E. And irreducible means that you cannot write it as a union of two proper analytic subsets. This is because of the next assumption mainly. If such that, sorry, such that the complex dimension, well, this is the only thing that makes sense here is greater than the complex dimension of E, but in particular, it means the real dimension, right? It's worth saying that dimension, the complex dimension of an analytic set is twice, sorry, is one half of its real dimension. The real dimension is always twice. It's not hard to see, but just because the, yeah, the dimension of C is, the complex dimension is one, the real dimension is two. All right, so the reason that this definition somehow is related to irreducibility, you don't want one of the components to have smaller dimension. So when you write that, you don't have to say for every irreducible component, the dimension is bigger. So we just say, let's take already irreducible, then the closure of X is analytic. Let's go back to this example and see why this example does not fit into this setting. Otherwise, it would be surprising. Here, we also removed from C, you can take M as, sorry, you remove as C square. You take E to be zero cross C. Until now, we are fine. We removed from C square an analytic set. But, the dimension of the graph of F, complex dimension one, if you want, the analytic is exactly the dimension of the set you removed. So we don't have that. The dimension of the set, yes, but dimension of graph of F equals the dimension of E. So we are not in the setting of the Remert Stein theorem. 
and it's fine because it should be because the closure is not analytic. But the point is that if the dimension of the red part is less than the dimension of the white part, then somehow you can look at the closure on the red part and everything will be still okay. Yeah, so you removed. Yeah, so E is small. So if you remove a point from C square, you're always okay. Uh, now, I want to say that this is really the easiest to formulate, but there are stronger results, and I put them already on the board. I will not state them because they are more difficult to state. But for example, I think there are also results of Chirka himself, but stronger results, which are now, uh, I think, more classical, is one by Schiffman. And there is, uh, when I say one, maybe it's a family of results, and by Bishop as well. And others, yeah. And uh, this, I think, the results of Schiffman are formulated in terms of uh, house of measure or house of dimension of the frontier. The results of Bishop, if I'm if I remember correctly, are formulated in terms of volumes as you approach to the frontier. And. Uh, Indeed, as actually Sergei and I knew when we wrote it, when we realized the theorem, the recently, I will write soon some Omenmal results, and at least some of the Omenmal results were proven recently using this uh, theorem of Bishop and facts that we know about volume in the uh, Omenmal structure. This is just a side remark. I will not say more on that. And now I will basically be listing. Uh, uh, some uh, removal of singularity is result uh, under O minimality. Oh. And all of these theorems, you make the obvious translations to K differentiable functions, K manifold, everything, and they all work in an abstract setting of an O minimal extension of a real closed field, with K being the algebraic closure of R. Of course, the examples that I gave don't all. They don't have all make sense in every structure, but the statements and the definitions all make sense in arbitrary or minimal structures. But for us now, let R be an some O minimal expansion. And I, I should just make a side remark. I hope I'm saying it correctly. Uh, we don't know of positive results that somehow divide, for example, polynomially bounded uh, or minimal structure from ones which are not polynomially bounded. Of course, some uh, objects will not be definable in, uh, in, uh, in polynomially bounded structures, but the theorems, as I would state, don't distinguish between polynomially bounded and not polynomially bounded, which might seem uh, reasonable to think. Okay, so these are all part of my work. Sergey is not here still, but he's somewhere around. Uh, okay, I, I think this may be the main result. I'm not sure if it's the or the same ordering that I I we proved them, but this is a result that I can say a few words about the proof, and uh, I think most other results follow from it. Assume you. So assume M is a definable complex manifold. Assume M is a definable complex manifold. So finitely many charts, blah, 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 etc. U in M, a definable open set. X in U, a definable analytic subset subset of U. Right, so this is the setting we had. Uh, in, this is the setting of the basic problem. 
but just everything definable. And now the theorem, if the dimension of the frontier of that, so I remind you the frontier is the closure minus the set. So in particular, this all lives in the complement of X of U because X inside U is closed. If the real dimension, so at this point, we don't know nothing about the frontier except an O minimal object is less than or equal to the dimension of X minus two, but this is not enough. And the same is true locally in every neighborhood, in every open set inside. So I should uh, uh, probably written it. Uh, yeah, I don't want, I don't want to have a, a large part of, this is like the irreducibility problem. I don't want to have a large part of X for which the frontier is small, but then to have somewhere a small part of X for which the frontier might be big relative to X or relative to this piece. Anyway, so I want, so uh, let me just, uh, uh, correct this. Uh, sorry, sorry. So assume that the frontier of X intersection V is less than or equal the dimension of X intersection V minus two. For every Every, uh, how should we say that? Yeah, for every definable, it doesn't matter really, definable open V inside M. Some places the frontier will be empty, so then we don't care. Right, so the property of the frontier is true locally everywhere. Then the closure of X is analytic, which is of course definable, right? That closure is definable, is analytic. That also means that it's a definable. Let me see. It has a definable analytic uh, analytic subset. Uh, yeah. Doesn't in M doesn't necessarily have to right. be definable. Yes. So the answer is yes. Uh, when I say analytic in M, I mean it's definable analytic. So yeah, yeah. Definable. what you're asking really are the functions which give locally are they definable yeah. in the same structure? And the yeah. answer is yes. Uh -huh. And part of the reason why uh, being analytic is definable because you can read off, as I will hopefully now say something about the proof, you can read off the functions from the set. I see. You don't need some external functions, analytic functions. You look at the set, we'll say in a second a few words about it, and you can read off the function from the set. Okay. Uh, notice that uh, I'll just comment. Instead of saying that there is a definable open set such that X is definable analytic subset of U, another way of saying all of that is that X is a locally subanalytic subset of U, where locally now goes back to what uh, uh, Jean-Philippe asked me, when the definition now is not for every Z in M, but you only know that for every Z in X, it is locally analytic, it is analytic, right? So. And the notion of locally analytic is basically the same thing because then you can, it means that there is an open set, it's locally closed, it's not hard to see that uh, being locally analytic implies locally closed. And then you just saying you can just cover all the points on X with open sets uniformly such that it will become closed now inside this open set. So this is another way of saying this, that every locally analytic set, which has this property, that the frontier is small everywhere, its closure is analytic as well and definably so. Now I, I, I will just draw some pictures because I will not uh, 
prove that, but I will try to say what the ingredients are, because again, I think that some of the ingredients in the ingredients would play a role in what uh, Jacob is planning to do, I think, at least in the paper, in the Gaga paper, it appears. So I hope it will give some feeling of what is going on. First of all, we can move to working charts and assume that U is an open subset of CN. We just move to the charts, we divide it. These are all local properties. And we just go to the closure, we work inside the chart of M and just intersect you with the chart and work there. So without loss of generality, U is CN and this is M, just working in chart. And now what are the ingredients? Maybe the main ingredient is the existence of nice generic projection, actually any, if you take a, a, a sequence, I think you need something like the dimension of X plus one. Generic K projection, not R projections, but K projections on a K linear subspace, C linear, sorry, C projection on C linear subspace of CN, you can cover x so x is in here you can cover x by finitely many open sets with the property that after change of coordinates you have nice projections what do we mean by nice so uh, can cover x by finitely many definable open sets On each open set, we have a generic, we have a projection, a, a C linear projection on each, or for each VI, there is a C linear projection pi from X onto, from X intersection VI onto C to the power of the dimension of X such that on X intersection VI, the projection is what's called proper on the image. It's not proper absolutely, but it's proper on the image such that for each A in X intersection VI, pi is proper with respect to pi A, which means that if you take any curve approaching pi a inside the image, the pre-image will not go to infinity, will not be, will have a limit point. Pi restricted to x is uh, proper on its x intersection vi is proper on its image. Okay, so one over x, projected here is proper on its image. Although it's not a proper map because we have a point outside the image for which you can approach in the pre-image of a compact that will not be compact, but it's proper on its image. What is not proper on its image, if you had something like that and a point here, then the projection here is not proper on this image because it belongs to the image and locally you have pre-images which you have a compact neighborhood of the point whose pre-image is bad. So you're only looking at compact neighborhoods of points on the image. And this is definitely all minimality, the fact that you can do it and cover the set, cover uh, X by finitely many sets like that. Right? If you had a spiral or something, things will be much more complicated. Or you had very bad frontier. We use here very much the fact that the frontier of X 
inside CN is not so bad. It's all minimal. So we have control over it. First step. So far, you did not use the assumption on the dimensions of the frontiers and so on. Uh, no, here you use the fact. Oh. No, no, I didn't use this assumption. Yeah, I think you're right. That at this point, yeah, this is a totally general or minimal structure. COM, not even assuming that X is analytic. Take any definable set uh -huh. inside R2, it's just analog to the same result over R. Take any definable set in R to the 2N. And you can do it with C in sorry with C to the end, and you can do it with C linear projection. Okay. Okay, now comes the picture that probably if you've done that, you all are familiar with that. So we have here C to the dimension of X on which you project. And now we have X. Maybe something like that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Probably not a good picture or something like that. And we have here ramification point, and we consider this projection. And now, now we are using the fact that because of the projection being proper on its image, and X is an I think I'm saying it correctly. And X is an analytic set. The image is open, right? So pi of x is, I think I don't need to remove anything for that, but uh, hmm, I hope I'm right. I think. Phi x intersected with v, i? Yes, yes, everything now, now without loss of generality, x is inside it's enough it's all local results so it's enough to do it like this. and now we are doing what one usually does i don't know it's called something like chow coordinate or so we let's write for points here so i'm looking now away from the uh, ramification point and let's call this uh, let's let's assume that this is one right let's assume that this is uh, the complement is dimension one for now. Okay, so just to simplify. Dimension of uh, the orthogonal complement. So, so this is just C. I'm just assuming this. And now we define an auxiliary. So this is X. We define an auxiliary function, G, Z, W. So we have definable choice. So by definable choice, we can choose arbitrarily. Well, of course, these are very bad choices, it could be, but we can choose branches above the, uh, the non-ramified non point. And we can write as uh, W minus Cj, then where J is, the maximal number so this is by all minimality there exists a maximum like this uh, to the to some k and these are definable but just definable but now we use theory of holomorphic functions and the fact so there are many things that i didn't say the fact that the number of zeros in a neighborhood of a nice point remains fixed this is what Lau i think has done in his paper on virus trust uh, this is where i've seen this first time but i think this is classical so even though these are bad functions possibly just continuous locally or cn locally well actually they have to be on differentiable points notice that on our differentiable point because these are these are regular re regular values regular points on x that actually these functions generically will be holomorphic functions, right? But there are bad places, however, because of the symmetry, one can prove because it's the same number of, uh, of uh, roots, just by symmetry reasons, one can prove that GZW turns out to be holomorphic Homomorphic 
outside uh, uh, ramification points. But I should say more also outside the singular points on X, because X is not a submanifold, it's just an analytic set. The analytic set has some regular values, some regular points where it's a submanifold, and some places where it's not a submanifold, right? The whole uh, program is to eliminate this non, uh, this uh, singular values, but I'm, we are ignoring the singular points of X. So I'm removing from the projection not only the ramification point, but also points where for some reason, this is uh, non smooth, maybe some cusps like this. I ignore them. But these are sets of smaller dimensions. Smaller, uh, these also, in, I mean, these are sets of small, these are analytic sets which have dimension, uh, a complex dimension one less than the dimension of X. So, in particular, we did not, even if we, re, if, even if we replace X by the regular values, by the regular points of X, where X is a manifold. We will still keep this property because we remove the singular set and the singular set as I mentioned real dimension two less than the set itself. So ramification point plus projection of uh, the singular point on X. All of these I throw away. But now we are left. Okay, I don't want to go up. We are left with a holomorphic function on a set such that the complement has dimension uh, less, than, less than or equal to two, less than or equal to dimension of the universe minus two. So now I, by the theorems I did on removal of singularities, so I'm cheating here, you have to see where it's continuous. There's more work to do because it's proper. Actually, you will see that even in the bad point, it will be continuous. Maybe so by, but what I want to say is that now you apply the, the theory on removal of singularities from, from a definable holomorphic function. And because the complement has small dimension, we can actually extend the function uniquely to the whole of you. So using previous results that I talked about last time on removal of singularities singularities from definable functions we can see that g extends to the whole of you to the whole projection holomorphically you're uh, really talking about the coefficients of this polynomial uh, I suppose which yes. is polynomial and, w right. and you right the coefficients of the polynomials which are defined on on yeah. the projection exactly yeah. that yeah. right exactly yeah. we can extend g w to u cross c because in the last coordinate we only have we have a polynomial in W holomorphically. And now we also see that this function tells you exactly that, that X here is the zero set of this function. So now we have exactly in front of us the definable, the definable analytic functions which kills X. So we see why X is actually not, you don't have to go locally, you can do it on the whole U cross C. And X becomes the zero set, X intersection U cross C is the zero set of this G in this one, when we have only one variable. I going think to. you shouldn't call it U because U was the original. Yeah, 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 you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Where did I? Maybe pi of V, pi of V, yeah. you're right. Thank you. All right. So this is the general, very general, the in very general terms. The, so we use all minimality to get the main, well, the main several issues, but definitely we use the fact that we can do 
cover X by these finitely many generic projections and sets on which the, the function is proper. And then this is very, uh, I think, classical in, uh, in the theory of uh, analytic uh, sets doing that. But the point is that we make it also everything definable. It's very explicit. All right, let me put the theorem two, which is a variant of the Remert Stein theorem in the O minimal setting, stronger. M, a definable analytic manifold. And now E, everything is like Remert's time. E in M, a definable analytic set, in particular closed. And now we don't need any assumption and X in M except definability, a definable analytic definable analytic or definable analytic in complement of this. So it's the same picture e is like the red set, X is the white set. But now we don't need any assumptions on the dimension. We get it for free. Because frontier of definable of home of of uh, minimal sets well behaved, then the closure of X is analytic. In and, uh, oh, no irreducibility. No, uh, no, 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 no. The, the irreducibility was just a way to talk about. I don't have Remmer's time. No, I do have. Yeah, it's here. Yeah, the reducibility anyway was just about to make sense of the dimension assumption. And I'll just say a word about this because this is nice. The, I won't say anything about the proof. The proof uses the fact, of course, that, that the frontier behaves well. And the reason why the frontier behaves well is somehow related to things that I have done in details. So we have here E, we have X which is only analytic outside E. And the question is, we want to show that this frontier is small. And the reason why the frontier is small is because if it was big, you could apply the identity theorem and get actually that the, uh, the okay, I'm not being precise, that the functions which define E at this point will have to be, uh, uh, will have to be, uh, zero on the whole neighborhood. Okay, so we have to prove, I'll just say that we have to prove that the, the intersection of a locally analytic set, X is a locally analytic set, with an analytic set, which sits outside of it, always has to be small, even locally. So, and this, has, this is related to the identity theorem, to the strong version of the identity theorem that we have need to show that the frontier of X intersection E is small in the sense of that theorem. And it turns out to be okay. And uh, okay, so I'll stop here. And uh, what's the so-called definable child theorem, which gives a result algebraicity comes out of this result. And I will what I'll do on Friday is I will just state the what's so-called definable Chow theorem and mainly do uh, uh, one or two examples in slightly more detailed examples again of lattices, some things like that, maybe modular space of elliptic curves and uh, just to make it more explicit and closer to I think the object that uh, Jacob will be talking about in his uh, in his module. All right. Maybe one remark about the terminology again. The term definable analytic subsets is a little ambiguous because it could mean an analytic subset which is definable, but what you really mean is something yeah. like 
Yeah. Which might, might call definably analytic. Yeah, so in the paper, actually, we have definably analytic yeah. and the definable, definably analytic. Oh. And we show that any analytic, yeah, all of this, you're right. I just, I didn't want to go. Oh, okay. Yeah, but what Lance says is that for the set to be definable, plus being analytic does not imply that it's everywhere given actually yeah. as yeah. a zero set of analytic. But I think yeah. at the end, it will be just because of that. Right, okay. So actually what we show is that every uh, like analytic is actually definably analytic in the strong sense that the functions themselves, because the whole point here, and this is the reason why it's definably in parameters that you don't need to know the functions who zero set, you just need to know the set and you can recover all the data of the functions from the set. But you're absolutely right. This I, I kind of swept it under the carpet here. All right. Now I, I noticed, I don't know if this is true that uh, I'm supposed to have a question session next week as well when I'm not here. Is this on purpose? I don't know. Uh, it always goes one week. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. I just have to remember to do it in advance.